owner. So this is, uh, I, I think the, in many other countries, pigeons are also raised for meat, for egg. Here in Indonesia, I, say, I don't see people eat pigeon, but they use for uh, this competition for game. So then we move to next level would be the, let's say the breed of domesticated animal. When we talk about the breed, here we are talking, say, uh, and we see, say the cow, in uh, here, I think in the world, there are, we are talking on something like around 1,000 breed of cattle in the world. But in Indonesia, I think most popular one would be Madura cattle, would be Bali cattle. This is what I know. I don't know other name yet. So this is, I think we've seen one species that would be what we talk about the breed. So I think it was, uh, in the world for all this, what I'm uh, put here, the big five domesticated animal, we're talking about cattle, sheep, goat, pigs, and the chicken. For each species, there will be something around 1,000 or more breed in the world. I think in Indonesia, the most popular one would be chickens. There are maybe 30, 40, uh, defined breed of chickens already, including the most popular one, this uh, laughing chickens, the Ketawa around the southern part of uh, Sulawesi or Makasa area. This uh, very popular chicken. This is already a, a, a population of domesticated chicken. People have been selecting them for a specific purpose. Uh, in this case, for this specific chicken, we, I think people like, like them uh, uh, to crew like uh, uh, similar to what people we love. So that's why they call the laughing chicken or the Kaitawa chicken. I think people have been select them, breed them, and reproduce them in a particular area, follow the specific uh, uh, trait, what we call the laughing trait of this chicken. That's what we are talking about, uh, breed of chicken. This is a, a population of bird. They share similar genetics because people have been doing selection, follow a single common trait of laughing trait. So they, by doing selection, all the chickens belong to the Kaitawa breed. They are more or less share a very similar genetic background. So that's what we talk about, the similar genetics. And also, the, if they have a similar genetics, morphologically or phenotypically, they will be looking similar. We look at most of the Katawa chicken, maybe they have a similar body size, similar body structure. As you say, yeah, for the plumage color, there's still quite a lot of difference within the Katawa breed. But uh, they are similar uh, morphologic trait to follow the human selection. And, uh, Certainly, these chicken are originated in a specific geographic location. Let's say, I don't know exactly where they were originated, but we see they are more popular in southern part of Sulawesi or close to Makassar. So then, this, uh, this uh, uh, specific chickens, they belong to a particular group of people, what we call people who have been breed them, who have been selecting them. So this is what we call the breeder of the Ketawa chicken or the owner of Ketawa chicken. So that's the, what we talk about one particular breed, but still, if you go into the village around, there are many 
families keep the back uh, keep the chickens in the backyard they don't know what to breed what we call this indigenous chickens or backyard chicken they have no specific morphology and then people doing uh, more or less nothing on the selection. They just keep this chicken in backyard, say, okay. They may feed them with some uh, kitchen waste or some rice bag, but they do not really go in for breeding or for selection. They just keep them. This chicken will match randomly in the, uh, uh, within the flock or even going across the flock. So therefore this chicken, what I think we call the indigenous chicken, they are not defined as a breed, but we, if they are li uh, 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 living in one specific uh, geographic area for a longer time, we could call them uh, ecotype because of the natural adaptation of the chickens to the specific environment. Because we know, say, the different environment may have very different climate parameters, the temperature, uh, uh, the humidity, then this chicken would have to adapt to them to the different uh, um, uh, condition then for them uh, even we human, we do not select them, but uh, there is a natural selection or the natural pressure on this chicken. So that's what we move to the third level. We could look at it as the genetic diversity of the farm animal genetic resources. When we talk about genetic resources, you see there are things we define as a breed, or ecotype, or strain, or lines of chicken. I think strains or lines, they are more specifically applied to chickens have been selected by uh, uh, humans for, let's say, for egg production or for meat production. If you look at the commercial chicken, they do not have a really say, a specific breed. Today, I think the, yes, we have uh, most popular, the commercial breed like white lake hound. That was popular more or less 50 years ago. That's what we call the commercial breed because 50 years ago, the commercial chickens, they were maintained as a breed. But today, if you talk about the commercial chicken, if you go to introduce a commercial uh, chicken for egg or for meat production, we are talking about the strain or lines because we see the uh, specific breed of wild lake hunt. There will be different lines uh, um, I, which have been selected for different trait. So they still belong to the wild lake hunt breed, but there will be a parent line uh, 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 the, we see the parent line. Some one group chicken, chicken may have been selected for, say, uh, uh, selected for sperm quality. This they have been putting a lot of um, pressure on selection of the cocks. So these cocks have been selected for better uh, sperm quality. This, line, this group of chicken will be used as a, uh, uh, say, the parent line or the, say, the male line. And the other group of chicken may have been selected for egg lay, for number of eggs or for the weight of eggs, because the eggs are laid by hands. So then this group of chicken will be used as a maternal line or a female line. So this is the, these lines or strains are kept by breeding company. When you go to buy chicken, you get a, a hybrid line. The commercial company will not give you this pure line of cork or the pure line of hay. They will give you a cross breed. They will cross these corks with better sperm quality 
the cross with the hand, which produce more eggs or better eggs. So then the cross is to line that make a hybrid chicken. We got a hybrid chicken for commercial production. So this is, is really a concept, uh, not a cross or the crop like rice, maize, wheat. I think in livestock, I think this is very common in chicken, in pigs, uh, a little bit less common, let's say in cattle, but people also doing this uh, specific selection follow the strain or lines within the breed. So this is what we talk about the three level of the farm animal biodiversity. We talk about the species of the animals or, or bird, which have been domesticated. We talk about the breed within each species. Then within each species, Oh, we talk, oh, there's also this third level, we talk about the genetic diversity. Now the, I mentioned that we have breed, we may have ecotype, or we have strain or line. And also we still have, I think in developing country like Indonesia, we still have a lot of backyard chicken. We call this the indigenous chicken. They are everywhere in Indonesia, we don't know if they are different genetically. If this, if you see, you go into the village, you see there are many chicken kept by many family. And we see in one family, you will see their chicken, they have very different plumage color, they have different body size, they may have different type of chicken. But we don't know if we could separate the chickens, for example, from Makarsa compared to chicken in Toranja. If there have been a, 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 a genetic differentiation or genetic separation, follow not to say human selection, but to follow the natural adaptation to different environment in Makarsa and to Toranja, I would see Toranja is will be high in attitude. There will be a low uh, temperature. Why in Makasa it will be very hot. So this this chicken, even we do not care of the chicken, but the chicken themselves they have to adapt to the different climate. They may have developed themselves a different genetics already. So that's what we talk about the genetic diversity of the farm animal genetic resources, which include the genetic diversity at the breed, ecotype, strain, line, and level. We need to look at it, how this breed or the lines are differentiated at the genetic level. If say the chickens across all Sulawesi, they share the same genetics, if he uses the genetic marker to do the characterization. At the end, they say, if all the chickens in Makar, in Sulawesi, they are stem, then we could, you know, we would define them as a, maybe a Sulawesi chicken. If we say chicken in Makasa is different from chicken from Toranja, then we will give a different name for example, the Makasa chicken, the Torancha chicken, then based on the, the difference in genetics, we may develop a different breeding plan uh, 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 to improve this chicken. They follow the differences in genetics. So that's the, because we have domesticated animal, we want to continuously to improve them for better productivity. They can lay more egg, they can produce more meat in terms of uh, chicken. So the, if you look at this slide here, I think when we talk about the domesticated animals, these are the animals or bird, which they have the ancestor from the wild species, the wildlife. For example, for uh, a buffalo, 
uh, of the Carabo, we still, I think in Sulawesi, we still have this wild buffalo, the Ani. We still have this draft, this uh, depressed, uh, smallest buffalo in northern part of Sulawesi. They are the wild buffalo, but somehow they are related to the domesticated buffalo, the Carabo we keep in house or on farm today. So we, if you look at these figures, we humans over the last say 10,000 years or more, we have only domesticated around uh, these, you know, 15 out of the 48 species. These 48 wide species, they have a body weight around about 41 kilo. We only domesticated some around one third of these wide species. These are non carnivores They are basically, these are the animals that eat mostly the grasses. And we only domesticated around 10 out of 10,000 bird, the wild bird. So the reason is, you know, some animals, we cannot domesticate them, like a liar, like a cheetah. They are basically the carnivores that eat meat. So we, for humans, they are also a competitor uh, 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 to us. Say they, we want to go to, before domestication, we go for hunting, say the wild caribou, the wild buffalo, but the tiger, they also hunting. They also hunt for wild uh, 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 buffalo for their life. So basically, they even sometimes we, we know they may attack people. So we cannot find, you know, to control the carnivores. So that's why we do not domesticate uh, animal uh, from carnivore species. And uh, similarly for bird, we only domesticated around 10 species very little number of species we domesticate because many birds, they can fly, you know, we, even today, we still have a, a problem to control, to confine some of the bird we have, we have uh, domesticated like a pheasant, uh, 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 these pheasant, some of these species we have domesticated, but still we have put a, a big net to confine them in the, uh, we see the, say, in the cage. Otherwise, they can still fly away from the farm. So this is the issue. So we have a particular interest at target of the species, which we can domesticate. Say, so yeah, we do not domesticate the uh, a species. They have a very small body size say, yeah, because we want to domesticate them. I think initially, even today, most of the domesticated animals we keep for meat, for egg, for milk. If we keep for meat at first, we want to go for a little, a bit, a little bit, uh, a big body sized animal so that we kill one individual, we can harvest a good amount of meat. So we don't look at the, those tiny animals and the, the animal which we cannot control. So this is the, the uh, is this idea for domestication. And also we have to think which animal we can domesticate. Even today, we have all the modern tools, but uh, you cannot domesticate them. You cannot domesticate say, a new species easily today. I think in the past, think about even say 100 or 500 years ago, you know, people, we do not have tools. Not like today, we could go by vehicle, we can travel by flight, we can go to catch animal easily in the jungle today. But in the past, you know, we do not have tools. We have to use, say, all the natural 
power from our body, we run behind an animal, we can try to catch them. So this is, there are many species, we cannot domesticate them for some reason. I will give you uh, uh, later, you know, why some animal we can domesticate, some we can't because they have a different genetics. You know, there is no gene for domestication. So the domestication basically including these, uh, you know, several steps I put here. The first step, basically, we have to try to see which animal are friendly to humans. So yes, if you approach to a wild animal, some of them, they are very scared, they are very sensitive. When they see humans, they run away. So you cannot really say catch them or you cannot keep them. But some of them, they are reluctant to human. They are friendly, let's say they can be easily associated with humans. So we can catch them, we can keep them uh, away from free breeding. So the free breeding, they say this natural breeding for wild animal, you know, there's no human interference. So that's what the first we isolate some of the animals from the wild so that they can breed under the human confinement. So therefore we have to have a, a, a house or a confinement to keep these animals next to our house. That's what we see today. If you go into the village, they are say, the chicken cage, chicken farm. They are close to our house. And we once we keep them in confinement, we start to breed them what we call in captivity because they are not going out in the wild. They start to breed in the confinement and we could arrange the mating. If you like the one cock met with another particular hen, you can put them together in one cage, allow them to mate. So this is what we call the controlled mating compared to the natural mating. Natural mating is still common, say, for the backyard chicken. In the village, there may be one cock or two cock in the same flock of chicken. And the people, we don't care which cock were met to with, uh, which hen. If we talk about their breeding, we want to do selection. We want to control the breeding or the mating of the cock and hen. So this is the, uh, the difference why the controlled breeding follow human selection. If you want to control breed, the breeding, at the first you want, you have to do selection. You have to have a purpose. Why you allow this, this cock matting another hen? Because you want to create a specific phenotype of chicken or you want to see, say people are, are taking this very large body sized um, pylon chicken from uh, uh, West Java, the back said to uh, uh, Sulawesi. People may cross the Pelon chicken, very large body with Ketawa chicken. So then the purpose would be say, you want to see if you can improve or you can increase the body size of the Ketawa chicken by this controlled breeding with uh, uh, Pelon chicken. So then the last will be some more the selective breeding and breed improvement. This is what I'm talking, so okay. When you buy, you take the Pelon chicken back to Sulawesi. You start to cross them with the Ketawa chicken for, uh, to improve the body size. Then you have to have record what's the initial body size of Ketawa chicken uh, the pelon chicken was the say the first generation of the crosses. 
how much increase you achieve. And by doing this, uh, say, improvement in the body size, you will have to do a lot of recording, say, the, the age in, uh, 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 of matur maturation for breeding, the uh, age for the laying the first egg, and you may have to record, say, the growth rate per day or growth rate per week or growth rate per month. Only if you have these records, which will allow you to compare the cocks, say you will have five pendulum cocks, maybe one, number one, number three, they have a larger body and their progeny, the cross, since, you know, with the Katawa chicken, they will grow faster compared to number two, number four, number five, Katawa cock, uh, the Pelon cocks. So this is what we talk about, the selective breeding and breed improvement. So by crossing Pelon at Katawa chicken, you will continue to do the selection and the breeding, maybe after three, four generations of selection then you may have developed a new line of chicken or new strain of these chickens. They share a similar genetics, which is basically a mixed genetic background from both the Pelon chicken and the Katawa chicken. And they are different from either Pelon or Katawa chicken. They, they have a unique genetic background they are expected to grow faster and to develop a large body. So that is the end, to say after four or five generations, you may uh, claim you have developed a, a new breed of uh, chicken, follow the selection and the breeding. So this is what we talk about, you know, you can see all the step from domestication of wider species, moving into the confinement and then the controlled breeding. And next more, uh, today we do a lot of selection and genetic improvement to develop a new uh, uh, breed of chicken. So chickens have been domesticated among the other animals, you know, uh, we are talking about this agriculture uh, uh, revolution, which took place around, I said, 12 to 14,000 years before today. So before, let's say around 15,000 years ago, our ancestors used to be a hunter, like today, like a tiger in the jungle. Our ancestors, if they want to have meat, they have to go into the jungle. They have to track down uh, some wild buffalo or wild chickens in the jungle. They have to uh, hunt them and take them back for meat. But as you know, over time, I think we could expect to say yes. Then people realized that they could not get enough food by hunting. Then they start to do some domestication. They keep some animal and they go out for hunting. They may come across a baby cow or a baby chicken. And they are babies. You know, the people will not kill them for meat. They are still young, they are baby. So people, our ancestors may take them back to the house, keep them. As the, say the first group of animals, they keep in confinement. That's how they got animals for domestication. And they keep them, they find, okay, they can keep them for uh, a reproduction in the house. And uh, that's what we call the domestic. After domestication, then you could achieve a relatively stable supply of food, not like a group for hunting. Going for hunting, you may not be successful today or tomorrow. Hunting is the opportunity. You will not be lucky enough today to get anything, or you are lucky tomorrow, you get many. 
But in the past, even you get to say five cow, you killed, you hunted for take back, but you cannot preserve them. Like here, it's very hot. This uh, you have uh, extra meat, but uh, you cannot keep them. So they will become bad after day or two. So you have still have to go out for hunting. But if you have animals domesticated, they, you keep them alive in backyard, in the house. That's why we call the livestock of domesticated animal. Livestock, you, the first word will be life. The second word is stock. A stock, say, yeah, if you, could, if you know this capital word today, there's a stock market. People play the cash, play money, play capital in this, in that market we call stock. But the domesticated animal we call livestock because they're alive. So we have stock in life in our home in terms of animal. Say yes, we have crop, say like rice, we keep rice in the house. If you are, you are hungry, you can go for cookie. Similarly, if you have uh, uh, the chicken being domesticated in the house, you can have chicken meat or egg every day, not like uh, this uh, opportunistic hunting. So that's where, say, when we have uh, a domestication of crop or animals, there was what we call the agricultural revolution because people started to do farming, to grow crop, to keep animal on land or in the house where they can control the crop production or animal production for their survival. So this is what we uh, I refer here the cultural revolution. Only when human population come across this agricultural revolution, then the human population got enough at a stable supply of food. Then the human population got increased and expanded. So over the last say 10,000, 15,000 years, after agricultural revolution, human population expanded and we migrate all of the world. Like today, we are basically in every corner of the globe on the earth. The most populated animal is the human being. Then followed our domesticated animal, the chicken, most popular animal. So this is why, you know, they say we human, we go for domestication of animal because uh, we know, say, in the past, even today, we talk about the climate change. You go for hunting. If the, the, the climate remains stable, the jungle forest will remain stable, then the wild animal in the jungle, they may have a relatively stable number. Then we may have a say uh, a good luck every day going for hunting. If the climate change, everything change, like today, there will be a lot of rain or it will become very hot, then we do not have enough food, so that's one. On the other hand, we human beings, we changed our behavior. We may have realized, say, yes, my God, going for hunting is really too much. Uh, hard life, we have to go out every day. Why we don't we to keep this younger animal? We reproduce them in our house so that they, we can have animal uh, around us. We don't need to run long kilometers every day for hunting. So that's where we change our behavior through the interaction with the environment, with the wild animals. So we started animal domestication. So the, we domesticate animal first definitely for food production. That's why I mentioned that we target the larger body sized animals for domestication. But not necessarily say why we domesticated chicken. 
The chickens is relatively small in body size. They lay very few eggs. If you look at it as the wide jungle farms, they lay maybe one clutch, five, 10 eggs in one year. So they really, they're not a good producer for egg or for meat. So people may have domesticated some animals just for fun. Chickens is one of the example. Today we believe chicken was domesticated not for food first, but we domesticate chicken just for fun, used for cook fighting. So this is a very popular activity, I think for humans in Southeast Asian countries, in Indonesia is one of them. I think the cocoa fighting in the village is still popular. And then we may use chicken for other purposes like uh, this um, uh, semani chicken people use for sacrifice. Yeah, we have laughing chicken just for fun. Why I say yes, yes, even for fun, yes, we at the end, we can kill uh, Ketawa chicken still for meat. So this is the say yes, we, why we domesticate animal, we first, we look for food. On the other hand, human being, we, when we got enough food, we want to have more entertainment. We want to have uh, something for fun. We keep, we domesticate chicken, we keep chicken for fighting. We make uh, the human beings happy. So this is the, I also say yes, like a cow or horses. At the first, we may use horses purely for transport. We can, we realize we can ride a horse, we can move faster in distance. We can use horse for hunting at later. Yes, we know human beings in the last say 100, 200 years, we have been fighting a lot about ourselves what we call the World War. Uh, we develop tools, including breeding horses for army or military purpose for, as a packing or riding animal. So then we also use buffalo, use cow for plowing our rice field. So this is the say, yeah, you can see the animals are domesticated for various, a very different purpose in the past. So I think I will skip this. After you know, follow the domestication, you know, I mentioned we have started to domesticate different species of animals, starting say from ruminant species, cow, sheep, goat, maybe starting around the, 12,000 years ago in Middle East, and followed by domestication of pigs in Europe and in Asia. And the younger species we may have domesticated, the most popular one could be chicken. The chickens may have been domesticated, we are talking something around 5,000 years ago, maybe can go up to 9,000 years ago. So the relatively chicken, the younger species we have domesticated. So this is the, uh, the slide on the left. I show you say, the sort of time frame, what we have been doing as uh, uh, what we call the pre uh, species on the top of all organisms on the earth. Human beings, we are able to control everything, including the crop at domesticated animal. We follow a different time scale. We have been doing different domestication activities in the past. The, on the right, you can see, follow the domestication, say not necessarily the human beings, we changed. Today, say we are not stronger compared to our ancestor 10,000 years ago. We cannot run into the jungle today for hunting. We are not good anymore because we changed our body structure, our behavior. We are not that powerful. Our wishing ability, we are not seeing 
that far compare our ancestors. But we have seen, we have developed a, big, a bigger brain. We are, looks, we are more smart than our ancestors in the past. We are more intelligent. We can use computer. We are even to make an artificial machine like humans, what we call all the AI technology today. So it seems, yes, we are uh, based on the agriculture, they follow the domestication. We got in the food, we changed ourselves as a species and all the animals we have domesticated, they have also changed in terms of behavior, in terms of body structure. If you look at on the right side, if you look at these pigs, on the top is the white bull. Because the white bull, they have go to go run in the jungle, they have to go for hunting, they have to go for fighting. So they, the white bull, they have a really a much better developed front part. After domestication, you can see the mid uh, 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 figure here, then the, the, uh, the weight of the front and the rear part become 50 to 50%. In the bottom, this is the modern breed, a modern pig. We have selected for more meat production. So most of the meat in the animal, they are distributed in the, this, uh, say the real part of the body. So that's where we can see the weight of a pig, a modern pig, the weight of the rare part take 70%, while the front part only 30%. The head becomes smaller and the brain becomes smaller too. So that's where we, you can imagine say, yes, we as a human being, we got a big brain, while the domesticated animals, the brain are shrink. They have a smaller brain. So they relatively, they are not smart anymore. They cannot go out for searching for food, if you release the domesticated pigs in the wild, most of them will die because of hunger. They cannot get food themselves. So the domesticated animal, they change the behavior. They stay with the humans. They know where the farm of themselves, they will come back home. Even they may go out. If you look at the, the chickens, the pigs in the village, they may go out in the daytime, but they'll come back in the evening because they feel much more uh, secure to stay close to humans. If they, they know, if they stay in the wild, in the jungle, they will be hunted by a tiger or mongoose or in the night. So that's where they change the body structure, they also change to their behavior. So this is really a very complicated uh, process of domestication. Why well, I think if you think about we are uh, really as smartest species, we are able to domesticate crop, a uh, wide plant become crop, one animal become livestock. On the other hand, people, we are also thinking we have been also domesticated ourselves because we have to live in house today. Like, you know, we have, we keep chicken in the cage. We have to live in the house today. If you sleep outside, then you may get sick, you may die. So that's where I say, okay, follow this process. We control animal, we control some plant. We, as the species in general, we have also become domesticated ourselves. So that's, there are a lot of change in our behavior, in our body structure, similarly to our animals. So therefore there have been, we could say there have been a lot of morphology, behavior, physiology, and also a lot of say definitely the genetic change over the process of domestication. So this is a, uh, sometimes I'm sure you say yes. You can imagine say, Humans 
got expanded because of domestication of animals. But the domestication is not taking place everywhere in the world. This is the archaeological the, a map show you where the civilization of humans in terms of domestication crop and animals based on the archaeological evidence. This is really something we know 50 years ago. If you look at in Asia, we only have one center of civilization, the number four. In this place, we domesticated pigs, chickens, and a buffalo. And if you look at the uh, place we label number three in West Asia or in the Middle East, where there is a place specifically defined as a fertile crescent in the country today around Iran, west part of uh, around Iraq and the west part of Iran. In that place, people in the past, they have domesticated cattle, sheep, goat, pigs, and camels. And in the South America, where the number two, where in the Andes mountain area, people domesticated llama and alpaca. And in the North American around Mexico, people domesticated turkey. So this is what we know based on the archaeological data, you know, I mentioned, you know, we, uh, the archaeological is, a, is a, a science, people collect evidence, collect data based on the, the digging, they go out to dig somewhere, they may find some bones, some archaeological remains of humans, of animals, for animals, yes, we eat animal, but we drop the bones somewhere. The bones are hard. The bones can be kept in nature for a longer time, over so many years or a few hundred years of time. Today, if we find these bones, we can identify them uh, in terms of species. We could go for dating, follow the physical approach, look at this, um, the compound dating, how old this piece of bone, so that we know that there was some people here, they eat some animal, they drop the bones here, this animal could have been domesticated that time. So therefore you, you can see only three, four centers of domestication in terms of animal. That's what we define as a civilization center. Only humans around these centers, they got enough food earlier, they can go out with their animals being domesticated. They go out, they got expanded, they migrate. The humans, you can see it like say for number four from East China, they may, these humans, they may come down to Indonesia a few thousand years back because they have uh, animals like chicken, buffalo, or pigs. So they may start to travel with the animals, they domesticated. So because the humans, this year we know you, this one place around number four, we got too many humans. There's not enough crop, there's not enough land. Say yes, one tribe, one family may decide to go to travel away from the center, they continue to move south, reach to Indonesia with the domesticated animal. Most likely they come down with chickens, with pigs, with the buffaloes in the past. So then also from number three, the center of domestication of cattle, sheep, goat, people move to east into Asia. Then they come, to South follow the Indian subcontinent. So that's where today we know the cows, the Toran cow, the goat and the sheep in Indonesia. They come follow the humans uh, expanded from uh, uh, Indian subcontinent. 
So this for in Indonesia, we know, so okay, our Madura cow, they are originated to follow, follow the human migration from West Asia to South Asia, along with the sheep goat, while the pigs in Sulawesi may come from North, from East Asia, or from China, let's say, if then the coal come down to Vietnam, then slowly go into Philippines, then come across the ocean into Indonesia, into Sulawesi. Similarly, the chickens is a little bit more complicated. The chicken may come from North and also from West Asia too. So I will show you later on uh, with the examples of chickens. This is the, you can see, say this is the, the humans, they take us the advantage of domesticated animal. They can go with this live animal. They migrate, they move one place to another place. They sit down, they reproduce animal. They got enough food. They reproduce themselves. The human population in a new place got expanded again that they continue to move out with the domesticated animals. So this is the, how the modern humans migrate expanded in the past with the support of agriculture. So this is the, what we know today is the, yes, if you look at it uh, in the global level, everywhere there are, say the livestock, we talk about the cattle, sheep, goat, chickens, if you look at it, the slide here, I think this is the, okay, the total, the, the, this slide, this figure on the top right corner is the cattle density in the world. Yes, in Indonesia, it's relatively less popular in terms of cattle. If you look at it, yes, maybe, in uh, uh, Sumatra, there are more cattle than in Java or in, uh, or even say very little cattle in Sulawesi. Then the, if you look at it, the, the, uh, this figure uh, in the bottom right here, this is the distribution of chickens. We can see Indonesia is very popular of chicken. There are a lot of chicken. The density of chicken is really very high in Sulawesi, in Java, moving into Kilimanjaro and um, uh, Sulawesi. So this is the, where you can see in the world, say yes. All the species, they were domesticated in, in one place or in two places, but today follow the human migration expansion. Every major domesticated animals, they are distributed in global scale. Chickens, cattle, sheep, goat, they are everywhere in the continent, in every country in the world. So we know, I think I mentioned, say yes, follow the domestication, selection and breeding. So the, this one animal become domesticated in one place, they follow migration expansion of humans, then there will be a natural adaptation because we bring animal from one place to another new place. The animal have to adapt to themselves. And in the modern time, in particular the last 200 years, humans, we have been doing a lot of human selection for uh, chicken, for sheep, goat, like today we have many chicken breed, many sheep goat breed. So this is, I think, a, a, statistic, a summary of the major domesticated species by the Food and uh, Agriculture Organization, the FAO of the U United Nations. So we can see for cattle, chicken, sheep, horse, goat, pigs, for these major species, for each species in the world, there could be already around 1,000 breed. But we have to keep in mind and say, yes, the breed, I mentioned some of the 
breed, they have a really a clear genetic background. They have a very different, unique genetics. So, but some of these chickens like Indonesia later I will mention. So the, we have a 30, 50 chicken breed in Indonesia, but at genetic level, they are very similar. So there may be not much genetic differences among the, the indigenous breed. But the commercial breed, they are very different one from another follow very intensified human selection. So this is the, the situation of the domesticated animal in terms of breed uh, uh, summarized by AFL. The livestock, you know, I mentioned this, this is very important because there is a, some sort of clear evidence to show the animal source the protein or the protein from animals are far more better to human health. We know, say, even say yes, if say you are from the rural family, the family, if they are poor, they do not have uh, uh, money to buy a uh, chicken, eat chicken every day. But when you, the family, if you have better economy, you have more money, you eat meat more or less every day, not to say every meal, but to the good family, they will eat meat every meal. Yes, we know say, some families, some people, they're vegetarian, follow sort of the religion or the belief. But most of people, we eat meat, we eat egg, we drink milk. So therefore the livestock uh, is very important in agriculture. In most of the countries, livestock production will take around 30, 40% in terms of uh, the cash value. In Indonesia, I think livestock will produce 30% of the agriculture GDP uh, uh, for sure. Uh, but people would say yes, so you, the livestock you only contribute 30%. Uh, uh, Therefore, the livestock may not be that important, but this is not true. I think depending how you count the product of crop and animal. If you make the product in cash value, you see this figure, the number one, number, uh, the number one column here, you can see this is the highest column. This is the value of cow milk. Because we keep cow, we keep cattle for milk, for meat, and also for plying, for transport. But uh, for meat and uh, milk, we can convert them into a cash value. So this is a show you say, yes, one product, the cow milk, the, if you look at it, the cash value is much more than all the rice we produce in the world in terms of the cash value. Then yes, we have third column is the meat from uh, our pigs. The number four column is the meat from cow. You can see, and also the number five would be the value of chicken meat. So the among the top five most important say commodity from agriculture, the number one is the cow milk, the number two is pig meat, number three cattle meat, the number four and the number five is the chicken meat. Only the rice in the world take a number two. So therefore, the, if you think about the value of livestock products we produce, they, they are much far more important than crop. So we, this is how you go. If you go to start a new project for livestock development, you have to, uh, to justify say, why livestock is important people that may give you say a general figure of this livestock GDP is only 30% among the agriculture, but we could look at it differently. Say, yes, a cow milk is much more valued than any agriculture commodities. 
So this is, I think, um, uh, let me see, okay. Should we take a break? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we, we take a break for five, 10 minutes. What's your plan? Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to this. Okay, okay, okay. Mungkin We... dipersilakan ini, Pak. Dipersilakan untuk ada yang mau bertanya atau gimana. Oke. Okay. Baik, uh, mungkin uh, saya persilahkan kepada uh, mahasiswa, ada yang ingin didiskusikan? Paham ya, kira-kira? Ya. Atau, per, atau perlu di ini, Pak, yang di atau perlu di, dipersilahkan. Atau perlu di summary dulu? Ya. Mungkin perlu di anu dulu, Prof. Ya. Oke. Okay. Disimpulkan begitu, Prof. Oke. Okay. Jadi ini kan uh, baru masuk di uh, apa penjelasan mengenai sumber daya genetik ya. Uh, kita ada dua topik hari ini kelihatannya. Uh, jadi ada sumber daya genetik, uh, rangkaian dari proses bagaimana ternak ternak yang ada kita kenal saat ini didomestikasi. Uh, kemudian di sesi kedua nanti mungkin akan lanjut ke teknologi-teknologi apa saja yang terbaru yang uh, digunakan dalam uh, mengkarakterisasi atau menilai performance dari uh, ternak kita. Nah tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Prof. Han bahwa uh, ada lima uh, ternak utama yang saat ini yang kita kenal, ada sapi, domba, kambing, babi, ayam, dan semua ternak itu itu awalnya berasal dari wild animal atau ternak ternak yang liar ya yang kemudian e, didomestikasi dengan macam-macam e, tujuan jadi e, dulu ancestor kita nenek moyang kita itu me, mendomestikasi hewan liar itu banyak banyak alasannya untuk e, melakukan itu salah satunya adalah e, sejak e, Manusia, manusia dahulu sudah mulai mengenal namanya cocok tanam, kemudian e, ber, menetap, tidak tidak e, nomaden lagi, sehingga dipikirkan bagaimana kalau ternak e, apa hewan-hewan liar yang sumber makanan itu didomestikasi. Jadi ada yang dipakai untuk tujuannya didomestikasi untuk e, sumber ma bahan makanan, ada untuk tenaga kerja, ada untuk dipakai untuk sebagai kendaraan, dan ada juga untuk e, tradisi atau budaya dan Uh, yang terbaru sekarang proses domestikasi itu juga uh, seiring dengan perubahan iklim, climate change dan uh, tingkah laku manusia. Ya ada mungkin yang untuk uh, khusus untuk hobi uh, seperti kita tahu tadi bahwa misalnya kalau, kalau kita di Sulawesi kan ada dikenal ada ayam ketawa yang dipakai untuk hewan hobi, kemudian macam-macam uh, hewan-hewan uh, yang ini. Nah kemudian uh, tadi juga dijelaskan oleh Prof Han bahwa kita khususnya di Sulsel itu masih punya sebenarnya sumber daya genetik yang yang banyak yang beragam. Sebagai contoh saja misalnya untuk kerbau, kita ada apa namanya anoa yang merupakan kerabat dekat dari kerbau yang kita kenal saat ini. Anoa itu adalah kerabat dekat dari kerbau. Nah anoa itu masih hidup liar dan uh, ini uh, merupakan salah satu sumber daya genetik yang saat ini masih uh, conserve atau atau terlestarikan terlestari, terlestarikan di uh, Sulawesi Selatan. Nah, kemudian tadi uh, ada juga beberapa macam alternatif yang ditawarkan bahwa uh, ada peluang-peluang kita untuk membentuk breed-breed baru misalnya dengan melakukan persilangan tadi eh, Propan kasih contoh misalnya kita kan di Sulsel ada ayam ketawa yang eh, apa karakteristiknya yang kita pelihara karena kemampuannya untuk eh, menghasilkan suara yang unik nah misalnya apakah dikawinkan dengan eh, ayam pelung yang juga memiliki karakteristik suara yang unik tapi di, di, di satu sisi ada juga uh, nilai positif lain yang kita ingin inginkan, misalnya ayam ketawa itu kan kecil, ayam pelung itu besar. Nah, kalau itu dikawinkan, uh, bisa ada namanya efek 
efek heterosis yang kita uh, bisa dapatkan dengan mendapatkan breed atau breed complement yang uh, dua-duanya, misalnya uh, suara yang bagus dari ayam ketawa dan uh, bobot badan yang tinggi dari ayam ayam pelung. Uh, tadi juga dijelaskan bagaimana proses domestikasi itu sampai uh, saat ini di mana awal-awal mula didomestikasi, kita lihat tadi penjelasannya ada empat Sebenarnya ada empat titik utama uh, domestikasi yang uh, ada di seluruh dunia yang uh, tadi uh, tergantung dari jenis uh, kena yang uh, didomestikasi. Misalnya untuk ayam kalkun itu adanya di uh, Amerika Tengah, lama alpaka itu yang seperti unta ada di juga di Amerika Selatan. Kemudian khusus untuk ternak-ternak yang utama itu ternyata di Asia. Asia yang pusatnya mungkin di daerah yang nomor ya. tiga tadi yang di daerah kalau kita kenal saat ini ya. Timur Tengah Mesopotamia itu tempat uh, awal mula domestikasi dari sapi domba kambing dan dan unta nah itu mungkin sedikit uh, pengantar ya uh, silahkan kalau ada yang ingin menanggapi atau ada yang ingin uh, bertanya silahkan boleh in English atau oleh boleh in bahasa silahkan Gimana? Ada yang ingin menanggapi? Atau kita lanjut ke sesi kedua? Prof. Boleh, boleh tambahkan sedikit, Pak? Ya, silakan, Bu. Ya. Jadi ini mengingatkan untuk uh, seluruh hmm. mahasiswa, jadi ini fungsinya Anda belajar uh, PIP. Gitu ya. Ini kan cerita PIP-nya cukup kental. Kemudian kalau Anda... Uh, cerdik memanfaatkan PIP itu tidak hanya menghafal, tentu Anda bisa menyambungkan materi pemahaman PIP itu tentang domestikasi secara apa secara luas tadi dengan materi genetika. Nah sekarang Anda sedang kuliah genetika. Nanti materi berikutnya disambungkan kembali persiapan semester depan memang kuliahnya adalah pemuliaan. Nah ini kita sekarang lagi kuliah genetika, mungkin ada cerita tadi ada Bapak cerita heterosis kah, nanti ada macam-macam dasar-dasar genetika itu yang perlu Anda pahami supaya bisa ceritanya ini bisa nyambung. Uh, jangan lupa nanti kan sekarang sedang kuliahnya ada ya tadi heterosis kah atau ada uh, gen dominan, gen resesif gitu ya, ada back cross kah, ada kawin silang lah. Nah, uh, teori-teori dasar itulah yang dipakai nanti untuk bisa memahami ceritanya Prof Han tadi. Ya, jadi jangan cuma parsial Anda memahami do, apa PIP, PIP saja, genetika, genetika saja. Nah ini kelihatan e, bersambungnya, benang merahnya bisa terlihat. Silakan mengikuti. Ya, terima kasih. Oke, okay, Prof Han, yeah. you may continue. I, I I don't know what's your plan. I, I'm thinking this is the first. Okay. Right. I I because I what I prepare. I I think if you look at the time. I could have another presentation focus on the genetic characterization. Uh -huh. uh, if you say today, I, I, I remember you early, your plan was say, uh, I will talk 45 minutes, we, we <laughs> could have some discussion. Uh -huh. I think in that case, I will, maybe I will just talk on one, two slides, I will stop, we can have discussion then. We can schedule for another one, I can, concentrate on the genetic correlation we give okay. another talk okay okay yeah 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 okay yeah uh, 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 welcome back i'm sorry you know i when i start to talk i always forgot time so this is really i didn't follow the the the, the program we talk with the uh, dr Ixan. i forgot that i i'm sorry for that i think this is the if we talk about lecture, I will be happy to say we can talk another one or two, uh, depending what is your interest. If you want to learn more, I can come up with a few more lectures. There's no problem. I'm happy to do it. So if you look at the time today, I think I will talk maybe one more, uh, two more slides. I will stop before I move into the specific part on the genetic characterization. So we, we can uh, have the first part of say the general introduction of the farm animal genetic resources, 
for today. Next time we can concentrate on the genetic fertilization. So this is the, I think let's do it so that you have some time for question. We can discuss a bit more uh, what I have to talk. To. If you have question or something uh, which are not clear to you, we can I can explain to you a little bit more. So follow the first part of my talk and give you the, the some sort of the idea information of the say the domestication and the importance of the farm animal and the farm animal genetic resources and what they are included. In, we say, okay, their species, their breed, their genetic diversity. So this is the three level and similar to the general biodiversity. Uh, if you think about the general, the wide uh, uh, species outside the agriculture, they're similar. We talk about the diversity, we talk about the ecosystem, we talk about the species diversity, we talk about the genetic diversity. So this is the for uh, um, agro system is when we do the research, we go for say the characterization, we follow more or less a similar structure as what people uh, working on the ecosystem. So um, I, I think the in, for myself, I think from here, I'm moving into a little bit more specific, what is we have been working on over my lifetime. I have been working on the animal genetics uh, for the last 30 more years. Uh, after I joined this International Livestock Research Institute, where we have a specific program in the Institute, working on the uh, improving the characterization of farm animal genetic resources. You can see from this slide, we are basically uh, dealing with many species uh, of domesticated animals from Africa into Asia. We also work a little bit in South America, but we have our major focus in Africa and uh, Asia, uh, the animal genetic resources. In these two major continent, there are many species from camels in the north, around the desert, to cow, horse, sheep, goat, and pigs, move to chickens, duck, geese. So there are many species. What is we want to do is we are trying to characterize, to quantify, and to map the diversity at a phenotypic level and at genetic level. I mentioned to you earlier, say yes, we have species, yes, which we know follow the taxonomy of zoology. We know what species we are talking about of domesticated animals, but there would be problem for, zo for taxonomy follow the zoology study. They don't know what we are working on. We are dealing with breed. There's no breed in wildlife. There's no breed. Breed is a, is a group of animal we humans, we have developed. We define a particular population of animal as a breed. I mentioned that they share similar genetics, they share origin, they share uh, uh, similar morphology or the phenotype. So they, they, uh, they are kept by a specific group of people in one specific geographic location. So this is very unique uh, in agriculture, which is very different from people working on the wildlife. So we basically, we one side, I think we move, we are basically working on the diversity more within the species because we are working 
uh, relatively very few species, five, 10 species compared to the widest species, there are a few thousand, uh, more than 10,000 birds or so. So we are working on relatively a few species. So, but do we have more than 1,000 breed for the major species? This is a very rich diversity. Some of these breeds were defined based on their phenotype or the morphology or specific trait like a uh, uh, chicken of Kitawa. We know this breed because this specific group of chickens, they can grow as the life of humans. They share, they inherit this specific trait. So we defined this specific population of chicken as the breed of Kitawa chicken. Just to follow one, uh, a parameter of this growing uh, character of chicken, we call life in chicken or Ketawa chicken. Similarly, we have Semani chicken. Semani chicken is a total black chicken. They are black in everything except the blood. They still have a red blood, but all the rest from plumage to bone to meat, everything. If they're really the highest quality of chicken, they have everything in black. So we humans, we select this group of chicken just to, to be black, okay? Then I think if you talk about the breed of Semani chicken, they know which to cook, which hen are the best. And they are very expensive. I happen to visit the Semani chicken place they have an association for around maybe 50, 100 chicken breeders of Semani chicken. And this base of Semani chicken, one chicken can, I don't know the uh, Indonesian rupee, but we know it costs like 500 US dollars for one single chicken of Semani because some people will come across the country, they come to that place to buy a specific Semani chicken home for sacrifice, for serving money purpose. So they don't care the money. Like this carabo, the buffalo in Taranja. We know this carabo, the Taranja buffalo is so expensive because they are used for serving money. So people spend a lot of money for that. If you say yes, if a chicken for meat, really say Indonesia, this ayam combo is really very cheap, but still the ayam combo is more expensive than the commercial chicken because they have better quality of meat or egg. So this is say, we know follow the phenotypic or follow the morphology or follow some specific trade we can see by our eye. We defined some breed of chicken already. That's where we say we can characterize all the Indonesian chicken first by the phenotypic data. We go to visit all the chickens in different islands to document them, to quantify the difference of chicken across different islands to, to give them different name of as a breed. They are all indigenous breed. They are not intensively selected, but they share some unique trait like a tower chicken. And we need to map them. We need to know where they are distributed. And we need to quantify what the level of diversity in the Katawa chicken. This growing ability, they can grow, but how long? across the different cocks. What's the minimum length to be a qualified Ketawa cock? And what the longest, uh, the longest growing in one time? And we need to do the characterization to quantify all these parameters. I follow the phenotypic data. And uh, next level, I mentioned that so we have 30, 40, indigenous chicken breed in Indonesia, but are they all different in terms of genetics? Maybe there are some 
phenotypic difference, but they are they may be very similar at a genetic level. So in genetic level, we need some genetic marker because we are, if we talk about the genetic characterization, we are not to simply use the plumage color because we know say yes for chicken, for example, we know the type of comb, the color of air loop, the color of plumage, the pattern of plumage, the signs of chicken. These are inherited prey. Some of these, for example, for uh, example for the mm, the type of comb, we know one gene or two gene are controlling the type of combs of chicken. And by observe the comb, say a single comb compared to a P comb, we know they have one gene difference. We can calculate the this earlier frequency based on the, the type of combs. But many uh, traits like the uh, plumage color, it is more complicated. The plumage color of a chicken, they can be controlled by maybe five, 10 different genes. It's very difficult to know the difference at a gene level. In, if you look at the plumage color, plumage pattern. So it will be more complicated. That is what we need to know. So we need to do this study at genetic level. We need to know the which gene are responsible for this trait and what's the difference at the gene level. That's what we move into the genetic characterization. We need a molecular marker. These markers can be at the sum, they will be by chemical marker. Some they could be by physiologic marker. Maybe some chicken they may have a high uh, a red cell uh, uh, compared to other chicken. This is a physio physiologic trait. Maybe some chicken they may have a, a high level of hemoglobin in the blood. This is what we talk about the biochemical trait. We need to use machine to measure this trait. We cannot observe this difference by our eye. Then we may move into say, okay, the level of hemoglobin is there not much difference, maybe high or low, but the, hemo, the molecular structure of hemoglobin can be very different. We can look at it at a protein level of hemoglobin structure. Maybe there's a mutation in the gene of hemoglobin they change the one amino acid of the hemoglobin of chicken. We can use a simple, say, the elect electrophoresis system in the laboratory to characterize the difference of hemoglobin molecular. So this is what we call the biochemical trait or at a protein level or the blood type like humans, similar in chicken. There are also different blood type of chickens. They are more complicated compared to humans. We have a, our blood type, the ABO system, it's a relative simple, but chickens have a, a very complicated blood group, blood type group. They may have, a, I see more than 10 different systems. So we could use the immuno, immunologics uh, uh, antibody to characterize the blood type, like what we do for humans, we can work on chicken. And to say yes, we can move into the DNA level. We can look at it, the, the difference in DNA sequences that should all the genetic diversity. And we could look and say yes, we, some of the trait like the body size of chicken, they are controlled by many genes. Some of the genes play the major role to change the body size, but there will be another 20, 30 genes. They also contribute to the difference of the body size in chicken. 
So we need to use, I think today, yeah, based on the genetic and genomic study, we know more about the, the DNA level difference. Then you will know also at the DNA level, some of the DNA, they are responsible for the coding of a protein. So the mutation may change uh, amino acid of a protein. But some of the change in the DNA sequences, they do not be reflected at DNA at protein level. The change, there are a lot of DNA mutation, but some of them, they do not have function. Most of the differences at DNA sequences, they do not have a function. They are not related to protein. So that is what uh, in the slide I mentioned the neutral and the functional diversity. So the neutral and the functional diversity, this is what we talk about at DNA level. If this mutation at DNA level has no function or has no contribution to the change in the phenotype, let's say the body size or the plumage color, these changes, they are uh, no function. They can be inherited just a, a freedom, like a neutral mutation, a neutral marker. They would be remain in our DNA. They will be inherited over generation, but they do not show any function. We can use this mutation, this DNA diversity to tracking down the inheritance of family, inheritance of breed, inheritance of the species. We could use this neutral marker to characterize the genetic diversity, the origin of a breed, the different genetic differentiation or the genetic separation of breed. While we if we think about the animal production and animal breeding, we are much more interested in more in the functional diversity. So the functional diversity, these are the mutation. They can be related to a function or to a gene expression, to the uh, difference in protein or to the, uh, the level of expression of MI or the level of uh, the amount of protein they can uh, express. So this is what we talk about the functional diversity. There are some uh, uh, mutation at DNA level, they can change the function of this piece of DNA. Some today we know there's the microRNA, there's the link RNA, these often they have a mutation. They, they have mutation, they have also function. These microRNA, the link RNA, they do not code in protein. Their mutation remain only at the DNA level. They can be, they cannot be converted into protein, but these mutations, they may change. They may have an impact on the uh, other part of the DNA, which may be responsible for the protein. So they may change the expression or the transcription and the per expression of that piece of DNA. So these, these are all functional mutation. So the, our study, if we think about the genetic characterization, we are talking about the neutral and the functional diversity at uh, one side at DNA level, and we may move into the uh, uh, R level. We may also move into the DNA level or the protein level, what we talk about the transcriptional or the proteinomics diversity. So these are the different level. The, we may have some markers at a phenotypic level. If this chicken can grow life and life in chicken, we call them a Katawa chicken. If they do not, they are not belonging to the Katawa chicken. Then we may move into the next level. What is the 
is it, can we go down to identify a protein or a piece of DNA or one gene or two which control this living crone, the crone as the living? That's what you really say we are, we have quite a strong interest to study the crowing ability of chicken using genomic approach. Hopefully we could identify one or two genes controlling this living capacity of chicken. Then we may know, say, what's the difference at DNA level of a Katawa chicken compared to other chickens. So this is to say, what we talk about, we can characterize, quantify the map, all level diversity, phenotypic, neutral at the function diversity of chickens, all the farm animal genetic resources in Indonesia, all in the world, so that we can inform the country of Indonesia. Say, yes, you have 50, chicken breed, uh, indigenous chicken breed, but based on the genetic criteria, we may only have three or five groups of chickens in different islands. These chickens then have a different genetics, which will give you the idea how you can go for uh, genetic improvement of these uh, indigenous chickens. If you say all the indigenous chickens in Java for example, in Java, they are all same. Then you say, yes, don't worry. There are plenty of local chicken in Java. You don't worry about the loose of these unique chickens in Java. There are a lot. You can select some farms for conservation of the unique Javanese chicken while open the door to all other farmers to improve the chicken. How to improve the Javanese chicken to me, maybe they are good to be improved for meat production. They may not be good to convert uh, egg layer because the phenotypic uniqueness because of the genetic diversity compared to the commercial broiler or commercial layer. I would see maybe the, we could uh, change the local Javanese chicken for more meat production, other than targeting to improve egg production. So this is a sort of recommendation we can uh, propose to the government and to the livestock sector, to the extensionist, they can think how to improve the Javanese chicken. Similarly, in other island in Indonesia or as the International Institute, we are trying to come up with our research across the country, across the Asia continent, moving into a African continent to understand, say, how the chicken diversity are distributed in different continent, where we can give a recommendation to international level, to, con to continent level, to country level for conservation and the utilization of their genetic resources. I think I will stop today. Then the next time we can concentrate on the genetic conservation. So this is my uh, talk for today. I think I'll stop. If you have questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Han. Uh, baik, tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Prof. Han. Jadi, mungkin uh, Prof. Lita. Prof. Lita. Prof. Lita monitor. Oh, ya. Yeah. Baik, uh, tadi Prof. Prof. Han sudah sampaikan bahwa sebenarnya uh, materinya belum uh, selesai masih ada dua masih ada satu topik lagi yang khusus tadi dijelaskan untuk animal genetik uh, Prof Han tadi sudah sampaikan bahwa kita lihat bahwa kalau anda anda lihat fenotipe dari uh, apa hewan ternak yang ada misalnya ayam kita lihat ada ayam ketawa ada ayam pelung ada ayam 
kampung biasa. Kita kan lihat macam-macam variasi genetik dari eh, baik variasi fenotip misalnya warna bulu saja misalnya. Nah itu dikontrol oleh eh, bisa saja ada satu atau dua eh, gen yang mengontrolnya. Nah kalau eh, satu atau dua gen yang mengontrol itu akan lebih mudah kita melihat atau menentukan eh, genotipenya misalnya <tuh> kalau di, di manusia kita lihat eh, golongan darah manusia misalnya nah, itu kan hanya ada eh, A, B, dan O nah kalau di golongan darah eh, ayam saja misalnya itu sangat sangat kompleks ada mungkin ada sekitar 10 eh, alel di situ yang yang mengontrolnya sehingga secara uh, genotipe akan sulit kita untuk uh, menentukannya. Nah, tadi Prof Han sudah sampaikan bahwa ada banyak uh, teknologi terbaru yang uh, bisa digunakan baik di, di tingkatan level uh, karakterisasi protein maupun karakterisasi uh, secara spesifik lagi ke DNA itu bisa kita uh, gunakan atau sebagai pendekatan untuk melihat perbedaan uh, fenotipe tersebut. Nah, sebenarnya untuk uh, apa namanya bahan uh, kuliah selanjutnya itu akan uh, spesifik membahas itu. Namun karena keterbatasan waktu, uh, mungkin kita akan uh, apakah nanti di schedule uh, kuliah umum kedua ya, untuk itu. Baik, uh, saya persilahkan kepada anda-anda untuk siapa tahu ada ingin yang didiskusikan dengan Prof Han atau ada pertanyaan eh, sebelum eh, kita eh, ini kita akhiri eh, sesi ini silakan Pak saya ingin minta motivasi sama Prof Han Pak Oke okay, oke okay, silakan okay. Good day sir first of all Oke okay. Good day sir first of all my name is Muhammad Fatwaramadan I would like to hear some advice from you on how to level up my study. Maybe like some motivation or something else. Thank you. Okay. So, Profan, my student need your suggestion or your motivation about how to speed up his study or his his uh, understanding. Maybe maybe especially for genetic. Or other 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 topic. What what you want to do? Mau mau apa? Apa apa tujuannya, Fatma uh, Fatwa? Gini pak, jadi kan tadi saya melihat uh, bapak tuh menjelaskan materinya tuh dengan penuh semangat. Mm-hmm. Jadi saya merasa apa penasaran apa yang membuat bapak ini semangat dia belajar supaya uh, saya minta tipsnya gitu pak tips. Bagaimana cara semangat belajar seperti itu? Oh, oke okay, oke. Okay. So, Prof Han. Yes. Uh, he anticipates that uh, see how you explain this material so impressive. So he need uh, your suggestion so to or, or your motivation to to deeply understand all the uh, maybe maybe all the topic of especially in animal genetic or uh, in livestock livestock study yeah <laughs> i still I, i did get to the really the say the question uh, i let me try and say i uh, if i'm uh, not totally wrong i think say yes i i been give you some you know the background and information, the knowledge, you know, of the, say, the importance of these uh, animal genetic resources. Or let's say, uh, if we take the example of the uh, chicken, if you think about, if you go to the village, you go to the household. So now the issue is that we need to know what the chicken they in one farm or in one family, the keep. I think the if you look at the reality, if you, you want to uh, do some characterization, or if you want to do target the, say the rural development through, you know, say the chicken breeding or improve the chicken production. 
I think you have to target uh, farmers, which they keep already, they keep a relatively large flock of chicken. If you say you go into a village, some family, they only have three, five chickens, they don't care. So then it will be very difficult to talk with them. I think we have to go to a family, they have some tradition, they like a chicken, they keep 30, 50, or even 100 chickens, they have some facility. Because if you have three, five chickens, you leave this chicken free, scavenge around, free move around, they don't care. I see our friend, they put 10 eggs for hatching, they get nine chicks. After two months, there was only two chicken left. The majority died or lost. I was talking to the owner, say yes, why don't you eat the eggs? You know, you only have one, two chicken after the 10 eggs, so you lose all the eggs, you lose money. But they, you know, people say, yeah, we don't care. This is a job of hay, we don't care. Because they don't keep the chicken uh, in captivity. These young baby chicken are maybe lost or maybe killed by cats around. So that's why, because they don't care the business. If you think about the, say, the characterization, the improvement, you have to look at people. They see chicken importance. They have an interest to keep chicken. Then you can look at what chicken they have. They have a purely an indigenous chicken. How we go for improvement? How uh, can we introduce some uh, exotic chicken for, for crossbreeding to improve their egg uh, number or to improve their growth rate? Or should we uh, uh, help them to select the chicken to be unique? Because you see, I mentioned the value of a semani chicken, it's so expensive. But there are not many people keep semani chicken because it's the association, they only a few people know what the best of semani chicken, they know the value. They know how to select, how to breed a semani chicken. So this is what you need to have a knowledge, you need to have people, you, I think today so you need to have a group of people working together on a specific genetic resource or on a specific breed of chicken. Okay. Okay. Mana Patwa? Uh, uh, jadi saya tangkap tu hmm. Bapak Pak Han kenapa dia semangat belajar karena penasaran dengan ayam. Hmm. Jadi bagaimana ayam itu bisa Uh, genetiknya tuh berubah-ubah gitu. Jadi, weh, masya Allah luar biasa kali pak. Terima kasih banyak. Oke, mantap. Ya, masih ada yang lain yang ingin menanggapi atau yang ingin ada punya uh, apa namanya uh, curiosity terhadap uh, apa yang sudah disampaikan oleh Prof Han. Silakan. Ya. Okay, uh, Prof Han, actually there are uh, also question from YouTube. So I will I will read it for you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Sahdar Baba. Right. Uh, he said that Uh, the biodiversity is a gift, but uh, monoculture, monoculture or or, or raise one only one one breed is a disaster. Is it true or not? Um, I see. Yes, depending say where you are. Say if you are close to a town to you keep chicken, you want to say yes, you have better access to the market, then you should, at least definitely, you have to have also enough capital, enough resources. In that case, you may go what we call the intensified uh, livestock. Intensified livestock means it's a 
more or less a commercial oriented. Okay, you produce, uh, say, a lot, same product, you can market easily. That means to say you have, you need a, a high input so that you can have a high output. It's not to necessarily say you will make more money in terms of efficiency, because this is just to say you can make money quick. If you keep, for say, a broiler chicken, you can uh, get a, a baby chick, you keep only six, seven weeks, you can sell them in the market. Although say the profit is not that high compared to somewhere like Kambun chicken, the Ayam Kambun, they are more higher profit, but you have to keep Ayam Kambun six or one year time. So that's where you have to make your decision how easy you can market uh, your product so that you may decide, say, I will keep only one type of, say, a broiler. I will just go for broiler production, or I may go for egg production. Depending really, say, your resources, your capacity, and uh, how easy you can have market. Otherwise, for the rural farming, as what we see, Say we, most of the family are what we call the self sustainers They do not have an easy market access. So they're in the mountainous area, they, are, they have a land, they, uh, they will keep many different animals. They have two, three cows, they may have also some goat, some chicken. Say yes, in that case, because you are, uh, not a, a farming for commercial. You are farming for more self-supply to the family. You may have some supply, uh, surplus chicken. You may only sell one, two chicken every month or sometime in the local market. So in that case, to be safe, because this livestock we know they are alive. We do not count them as the capital if we do not kill them for money. You, this chicken or goat, they may die after disease. This is always the risk of livestock production. So in that case, you may have a different breed, different species in the farm, so that you uh, reduce the risk for farming. So this is depending where you are, where your resources are more important to say the market access. Because today as a single farmer, it will be very difficult to, competing, to compete with commercial farms. If you think about the uh, 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 laying chicken, we know in Indonesia that many big farms, they produce eggs. They, have a standard management, they have a standard product, they can sell, market the egg into supermarket. If you keep a 300 chicken for egg, you cannot sell your egg into supermarket. Then the profit in the local market is very low. So they all really say you have to think your setting, where you are, how are you going to sell your product? So if you are not able to do a, say a, a, a market oriented production, then you have to keep more breed or keep more species to reduce the risk because the livestock is a really high risk business. Unless you kill them, they can be a piece of meat. Otherwise, their life, they may die tomorrow. If they die from disease, you lose all the value. So this is the sort of thing you have to keep in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Ham, for your explanation. Uh, the, next, the next question from Mr. Muhammad Asaf Muharram. Uh, he, he said that, uh, Based on your uh, explanation, the early human uh, domesticated uh, the big five of livestock like uh, cattle, sheep, uh, goat, pig, and uh, chicken. 
uh, but why you don't mention about the horse uh, when when the horse domesticated horse the uh, i think is today based on the more the new genomic analysis horses are a relatively newer species in terms of domestication maybe five thousand six thousand uh because we see today horse is hard to control compared to the ruminant cow sheep goat horse is relatively hard to control and uh, uh, horse i think you know because people domestic horse first for mainly for riding for transport so that's where the horse were domesticated much later and uh, the similar, I think maybe some uh, similar age uh, uh, to chickens, because chickens were not domesticated the first for meat. You know, it's a small bird, people don't see the value of domestication. That's where it's also linking. Maybe there's also an issue linking, we don't know yet, linking to a so called uh, movement of civilized human population. Because we see, okay, the cattle, sheep, goat were domesticated in the uh, near Asians, uh, uh, in the, so that was uh, ten thousand years back. Maybe it's only those people when they come into East Asia with the cow or sheep, goat, they see, oh, there's a white buffalo. Why don't we domesticate this animal? They know they have a knowledge. Why the indigenous people? live there with a wild buffalo like these people in North uh, Sulawesi. They never go to try to domesticate this small buffalo. Why? Because they do not think of it. They may see it's so difficult to control them. You need to have a new brain, a new idea. This also say why uh, other species were domesticated later because Maybe the indigenous people were there, but they never think of it. Like in Africa, we have many plenty of zebra. That's where I went to Kenya 20 years ago. I see this really big population of zebra run, move around, you know, in the grass line in Africa, but the people are dying because of hunger. I was joking with them. Why don't you go to kill zebra for food? You are hunger, but they say, "Oh, we are serious, you know, prayer. We know their wildlife. They don't belong to us. We cannot eat them." I say, "Yeah, if it's Chinese, we eat everything. We kill everything. We do not die of hunger, you know, in front of a zebra. We eat zebra first. So this is all really say, you know, the idea." As the traditional people, the indigenous people, they have as their belief, they live in harmony with the environment, with the animals around them. They never think go to kill them, and they never go to interfere them. So that's why it's a main, because horse were domesticated somewhere in the North Asia, a little bit West Asia, but chicken, you see, I will show you next time. Chicken was domesticated really in the Southeast Asia. Maybe really the, some people come down with the domesticated cow, sheep, goat. Then they say, yes, let's keep this uh, jungle from uh, uh, in the house. Then they become a domesticated chicken later on because the, the idea come from outside from exotic people, why the indigenous people, we may go for hunting, but we do not know how to uh, do the domestication. If you look at it today, say all the civilization, nothing happened in Africa. There's no species, I would say that no species domesticated in Africa, but still there are plenty of wildlife here in Africa. So there's a, a really say there is a way of life of humans with ecosystem with the life around. So they have a traditional belief, they have traditional religion. So these are all really say uh, 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 affect say how 
humans, we uh, uh, go around, you know, to look at it as the world, you know, nearby, why we do not domesticate, why they say the horse or chicken were domesticated later on, because they were not around that uh, uh, place of, of, of sheep or to cow. So then the people move out, they, they, they know how to do it. They have this idea to control other animals. So that's where when they come to a new place, come in front a new species, they may try to do something, but not every wide species can come under the control of humans. Like for zebra, I mentioned again, in the last 200 years, many people tried to domesticate zebra, but all of them failed till today. We have all the modern tools, but we cannot manage the domestication of zebra. While like a species of fox, a small uh, uh, carnival animal in the north, the fox have been domesticated again and again in the last 100 years or even last 50 years, people were able to capture wider fox, they managed to domesticate them. So this can be repeatedly done for this species, but not for zebra. So there's a genetics in the back of the species. They may not carry the gene for domestication. So then we cannot domesticate them. Some other animals, they may have genes for domestication. We can be easily to go to control them for domestication. So this is the two ways so to be interact on one side. If we, as a human being, we know how to do it. On the other hand, depending also the genetics of the wild species. Okay. Okay, thank you. Baik, um, Prof. Lita, ada yang mau ditambahkan? Uh, nampaknya sudah cukup jelas. Uh, saya cuma berharap mahasiswa bisa mengambil benang merahnya, tidak... Uh, Terpars, apa parsial parsial ya mata kuliahnya ini kelihatannya benar-benar benang merah itu yang tadi saya tulis di grup mulai dari pemahaman tentang domestikasi kemudian ke genetik kemudian ke breeding kemudian agak spread juga ke tentang pakan sedikit tentang tingkah laku sedikit itu ya sampai ke penggunaan gen gen untuk nanti dikembangbiakan menjadi ya tadi bilang zebra mungkin kita bisa domestikasi zebra kah atau fox tadi ya dibilang serigala itu bisa jadi suatu saat bisa diteliti untuk menjadi ternak yang jenis ternak yang baru misalnya sama yang kita lakukan untuk belibis bu ya Ya, yang kita coba sekarang mungkin ada yang tertarik nanti belibis kita mau coba. Do you know uh, Prof Han yes. about belibis? Uh, whistle, whistle duck. Whistle duck. Whistle duck. We have uh, some 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 type of, about uh, whistle duck in South Sulawesi, and yeah. uh, we call it uh, apa ya belibis in Indonesia in bahasa Indonesia. So uh, in apa namanya sidrap ya sidenreng rapang regency um, since long time ago they uh, sometimes they eat the that uh, meat but uh, still still like apa namanya masih wild, li, la, wild still like wild okay okay yeah the duck is really a complicated species ducks mm. They are domesticated, but they are uh, very common in terms of the hybridization between the domesticated duck and the wild duck. And they also there are a lot of uh, duck species in the wild. They do not have an uh, isolation in reproduction. Many wild duck can hybridize. So this is really uh, very difficult with the water bird. In particular, so that is really a mystery. You know, we don't know, uh, we do not know much of the domestication. I do not know really say which species contribute to the domesticate the mala duck and the mosquito duck. Mm -hmm. And even today, because I think in, in the rural 
these ducks, you know, they uh, people live in the pond. They are maybe this is there's a migration of the white duck around. They, there are a lot of hybridization between very different species of white duck and uh, also with the domestic duck. So this is really, yeah, we need to do to collect samples to do more study. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Silakan Pak Isan. Ya, baik. Mungkin adik-adik uh, mahasiswa masih ada yang ingin disampaikan. Kita sudah hampir uh, sudah le lewat dua jam dua ya. Jam. <laughs> baik. Beliau betah kalau ngomong. Yeah. Yes, this is a pray time in in, in Burgo in Java. Time oh, it's already. Ya, yeah, uh, sebenarnya Bu masih uh, apa namanya? Topik kedua itu belum selesai. Mm -hmm. Yang Ya, yeah, so you can look at the time we can schedule for yeah, yeah, we yeah. can yeah. next we can arrange yeah, we can arrange as uh, okay. uh, we can the next uh, on the time. Okay. We have a next uh, presentation or lecture. Good. Yes, uh, I think uh, for next next lecture we name it. Maybe Mr. Isan will arrange the time and then yeah. We'll inform you later. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. happy. Yes. Okay. Thank you for all the students, the colleagues, your time. I'm sorry I took too much time for talking. Oh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a good patience. opportunity for our students to uh, yes. learn about uh, English. English uh, is very different for Indonesian English and yes. uh, Jap um, Chinese English and other English. For example, uh, Singapore English or Japanese English, they also learn how to listen, and then beside mm -hmm. that, they they also have to learn about the the content. Yeah. Oh, two really... two big two big uh, point today. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, we be, before we close this lecture, maybe I. I call for all students to say terima kasih to Prof Han. Buka semua mic yeah, yeah. and say terima no, kasih. Thank you, thank you. Buka thank semua. You. Thank you, Prof Han. 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 Oke, okay, silakan ditutup Pak Isan. Ya, yeah, oke. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you Prof Han for your time. Yeah, good, good. Maybe and keep help, sir. Keep help and I hope we can meet meet again in Makassar. Yeah, sure, I would love to come back. To collect, come collect back. sample or uh, yeah. do, do it next, next when uh, research do it. collaboration yeah. with, with... Yes, uh, we, have, we have to make a next, <laughs> next, apa ya namanya, yeah. target yeah. for doing, doing joint, joint research and joint yeah, publication. Sure, sure. Yeah. For, for, your, for your information, Prof Han, uh, yeah. for this year, we arrange to... Uh, to a research topic about uh, chicken and duck. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, maybe next time we will discuss more about this this uh, research. Right. Which, which part we we, we can collab uh, collaborate together uh, for this research. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. See you. See you again, sir. Yeah, see you next time. Bye. Okay. Okay. See you all, okay. students. Okay. Bye bye. See you. See you. Yeah. See you. Silakan. Yeah. <laughs> Oke okay, Pak Isan mungkin bisa ditutup Tugasnya jangan lupa semuanya uh, 
uh, bukan sekedar memasukkan tugas, tapi benar-benar Anda pelajari lagi karena ada di YouTube ya bisa didengar kembali uh, rekamannya. Uh, intinya memang itu sangat sangat ini ya sebenarnya kalau Anda bisa pahami itu uh, banyak sekali hal yang bisa ditulis dan bisa dipahami. tidak terbatas mata kuliah genetik saja. Jadi yang disampaikan oleh dosen genetik mungkin sekarang baru Pak Isan, nanti berapa minggu lagi saya, kemudian Pak Lelah dan Pak Sudirman Bacok itu basic dari basic dari genetiknya saja. Nah, diapakan setelah itu gitu ya? Diapakan mau apa nih habis ngerti basicnya, ngerti mengawinkan, mengerti bagaimana itu pewarisan sifat, bagaimana itu back cross test cross kemudian apalagi macam-macam gitu ya. Ada kriptomer lah, ada tadi macam-macam mengenai genetik begitu mau diapakan gitu. Nah, ternyata tadi banyak diterangkan itu penggunaannya tuh banyak. Misalnya tadi saya ambil saya sedikit uh, ini ya mungkin ada udah banyak yang keluar. Dari soal warnanya ini aja warnanya bul, apa ayam itu loh, jengger ayam ya. Nah, itu kan di itu nanti sifat itu sifat apa? Kemudian kalau sifat itu dipengaruhi oleh berapa gen? Satu, dua atau banyak gen? Kemudian kenapa bisa warna-warna? Kenapa bisa bentuknya macam-macam? Nah, itu teorinya di mata kuliah. Nah, uh, implementasinya untuk mungkin dalam penelitian. Nah, tadi yang Pahan ceritakan ada banyak pengaruhnya. Nah itu coba anda baca banyak publikasi supaya anda bisa mengerti setelah belajar teorinya terus diteliti orang untuk apa terus nanti mau dipakai dalam dunia nyatanya apa gitu ya. Jadi tidak selamanya harus penelitian itu meningkatkan produksi susu, meningkatkan produksi daging dengan cara yang lain kita juga berkontribusi pada ilmu pengetahuan dan masyarakat gitu ya. Oke, okay, terima kasih sudah bergabung semuanya. Semoga tidak hanya duduk datang dengar diam dan bingung, tapi Anda bisa mengambil manfaat dari pertemuan ini. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Banyak, Bu. Terima kasih, Bu. Oke, saya pamit ya. Iya, Bu. Terima kasih, Bu. Selamat